Axters, Alex Glow here. Every Tuesday I get to chat with brilliant minds in the electronics community, including experts from major companies, small hardware business owners, artists, inventors, and innovators of all stripes. We're doing something special this time, counting down our top 10 most popular interviews from 2021, with shining moments from each one. Here are the first five. Dive in and don't forget to check out the full interviews linked below. Thumbi actually came out of a design Ben worked on. Oh yeah, yeah. this is like the little. It was just a little personal project. <laughs> um, so it's just we we're just trying to see how small I could make something. So this is like a little 3D printed case. I guess we we're kind of just looking through all the smallest parts and just seeing what was out there and just put them all together into the smallest possible package. And that's kind of how that was made. I guess just over the last year, we decided to see if we could make it into a production ready design. Uh, we sent out some samples. Now, Alex, you actually have one. Yeah. Uh, so that's an injection molding enclosure. We're still going to refine that a little bit. Uh, but based on that, we can keep the, the cost of it really quite low. So here is an early version of Thumbies. Yeah, so oh, that's this is so cool. the actual a little prototype panel of uh, circuit boards there. So, so we made yeah. these like a week or two ago across the, across the hall in our yeah. kind of electronics fab shop uh, SMT line. We kind of did this because, again, we're going to a lot of maker fairs. And uh -huh. we come across you at a number of maker fairs, too. And so this was done as kind of a, a little low-end project because we'd have a lot of kids come over. And they want, like, arcades and whatnot. And it's oh. kind of outside their budget. So we wanted to make a little thing that attracts attention. So it's got a little persistence of vision on it, a capacitive touch on the back. <laughs> no, 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 so no, these no, are just little cool. RGB LEDs. And they are really that blinding. Yeah, they are so. blinding, so... <laughs> Like, and you can program it too. So a lot of kids like that. Kids of all ages, I'd say. Adults <laughs> like it too. Yeah, you brought it to a bring a hack dinner one time, I think, and everyone was like, ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love this idea that, yeah, you have this really amazing product that also tends to cost a little bit more, maybe outside of a kid gift price range, but like, therefore you make this other thing that's like really shiny and really kid friendly and also like costs a little bit less brilliant. That's I mean, kind of why we like the uh, Thumbie too. It's just because um, we're able to make it very cheaply and sell it cheaply. So some of our other things like the arcades, I mean, we really like these, but with the screen, the screen's kind of a higher end screen that goes in there. And just to buy that screen in volume um, is quite expensive. Yeah, I mean, the price will be. So that's why the price yeah. of those things are high. And so it's like, people are like, oh, that thing should cost a lot less. It's like, well, we can't make it for a lot less. We're not making that many of them. Whereas the Thumbie is something finally we can make here and it's you know under twenty dollars, so it's kind of really appropriately priced for what it is. Whereas the arcade's over fifty dollars, so people are like, I'm not gonna pay fifty bucks for that. So affordable product. Yeah. Compared to some <laughs> still high the end. Still so high, very high end, but very low cost. The AxiDraw is a um, pen plotter. Pen plotters have been around for decades, uh, but they've had a resurgence recently, in part because of AxiDraw, uh, that it's a modern pen plotter uh, designed to be used with modern computers. Really flexible that you can use any pen um, and have it draw on anything. Yeah, so we were talking about the, the new mini kit. So the AxiDraw mini kit is um, a small version that can do postcard size um, and uh, is popular with people who want to build robots, not just draw. And um, uh, the it's perfect for postcards. And uh, so Plotter Twitter had has started doing postcard exchanges to give you sort of that tangible connection to other people. We're super lucky that we don't actually do a whole lot of uh, plotter output, but they've included us anyway. So they've sent us a bunch of postcards. Um, uh -huh which is so cool. I love our plotter people, um, plotter Twitter. I got this one from May uh, from uh, Paul Rickards. Here's one from uh, Brie Pettis. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, they're just really wonderful. Oh, Frank um, uh, Albanicius uh, to this one. I love wow, this. beautiful. This was actually pre pre pandemic, but it's grown in popularity since the lockdowns and things. Um, here, this one's from June. This is um, Joel Camarada. Wow, that's gorgeous. Isn't that beautiful? Really powerful when you give people the ability to write their own code and consider their own modules. And mm. one colleague of mine, when I was describing this to him, he's like, so you were saying that I could sign Bitcoin transactions with it. And I'm <laughs> like, well, I, I, I don't go in for that sort of thing, but... I mean, I guess if you took the watch apart and plug it into USB, like it has a microcontroller that can do things, like maybe it could sign Bitcoin transactions. Uh -huh. But, but, um, password kind of things. And 
Well, one time passwords, it can, I'm sure, I'm certain it can do because it's Ooh. got, uh, the display has six characters. So for oh, a lot yeah. of one time passwords. Uh, but yeah, it's got six characters on the bottom. It's got a number on the top right that can handle numbers from zero to 39. Hmm. And um, then in the middle, it's got two letters. So I could imagine GO for Google, a countdown from 30 seconds, and your six yeah. character one time password at the bottom. That seems not impossible to me. Uh, I might not be able to like have the time or like knowledge to implement that algorithm, but if I could get this hardware into people's hands, someone's probably going to be excited enough to implement that algorithm and make their watch do one-time passwords, right? <laughs> Use PaperChess because uh, it's like a really nice library to create vector graphics. And I started my generative stuff with processing and P5, and that's an mm -hmm. amazing, amazing library, amazing framework. Um, but at the time where I did this, it it sort of lacked proper export for vector graphics, and I also was missing certain certain functions. Like if you maybe have uh, worked with Inkscape, you have usually mm -hmm. functions that can do Boolean operations, where you like can merge shapes or cut out shapes and stuff. Mm. And this is super helpful if you do anything CNC pen plotter related, and that's why I go with PaperJS. I've pulled up your frozen system, mm -hmm. Snowflake PCBs, and this is so cool because not only can people order these from uh, PCBWay, but also you can generate your own because you, sh you shared all of this stuff on GitHub. I started watching your video on how you procedurally generate PCBs. So what's your workflow for this? So um, I use KiCad. And at first I thought like, oh, I can just maybe import SVGs directly. I'm rather new to PCB uh -huh. design, <laughs> but I very quickly figured out that importing SVGs is rather hard, at least mm. uh, about one year ago. Then I was searching around what's the better way to import. And then I stumbled upon uh, Inkscape plugin, which is called SVG to Shenzhen, really nice name. <laughs> and that does a lot of stuff for you so you can decide which vector graphic shape goes on which layer on the PCB, and then you can export it as footprint or as whole PCB KiCad oh, project. That's, so that's cool. amazing. Yeah, that's such a great tool. So it's a plugin for Inkscape, and it has one function which sets up your project to, to fit the workflow. So it creates a bunch of layers for you, which resembles uh, the copper layer or the solder mask layer and stuff. And then you can open your already created SVG file or make a new one, whatever. And then you like sort it onto the layers where you want it to go in KiCad. And then it's just export, opening KiCad, done. You went viral last year for this rotary on smartphone kit. Can you tell us a bit about why you built this kit and how you built it? Uh, yeah, well, it didn't start as a kit at all. Of course, I mean, right. <laughs> what you have on the screen is the new one I'm working on now. I've been collecting rotary dials for a long time, thinking I would use them as some kind of a input device for something. I don't know. It just is not something you see people using. I was thinking of just making a num pad, like a number pad for a computer that would be a rotary dial. Then I thought, oh, if I'm going to do this, why not? Oh, 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 yeah, I was browsing, browsing Adafruit, the Adafruit website, and uh, she had something called the Phona, which is a, basically a cell phone development board. And I'm like, oh, if I use that with a rotary dial, I could make a, a, a new kind of phone that uses a rotary dial to input numbers. No, um, but it was like, yeah, there's, yeah, there's the early prototype with, with just the, the Phona from Adafruit and an Arduino and the rotary dial just to prove to myself that, you know, it wasn't too hard to uh, make a complete working phone this way. And then I packaged that into a 3D printed kind of thing that I could carry in my pocket. And oh, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and then I was like, well, if I'm going to do this, I should I should play out an actual printed circuit board and, and do it, you know, for real. Because I, I was dead set on doing it as simple as possible and just plugging wires into each other. I can't, I can't do it. I mean, I just, every time <laughs> I do that, I'm like, oh, I could just go to the ultimate extreme. So I laid out the, the board and, and it turned kind of into that. Then I made another version. Okay, so there is it coming together, the much sleeker version you see it on, yeah. on the bench. And Ooh. now it's starting to look like, you know, almost like something you'd buy. And I put these e-paper in the back and I curved it. I just like went all out. And this is just a personal, it's just like, I wanted to have, use it as my primary phone because I hate smartphones. I don't have a smartphone and use this as my phone. And, uh, and I did. And then everyone was asking me to uh, to sell it, and I'm like, no, I don't want to sell it. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> in the business of making. Nobody. This is a stupid thing to begin with. I mean, you know, who's going to want a rotary phone? <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> and and meanwhile, I was trying to start my company, Sky's Edge, which I don't really think of as a company. It's like an open source lab kind of thing to make robotic stuff. Anyway, um, I, I wound up turning it quickly into a kit and produced about a hundred of them, a little bit more, and and they sold out. 
pretty quickly. That was early last year. And it was a really kind of an advanced build, not something everyone or hardly anyone would be comfortable putting together. A lot of hands-on soldering, a lot of just really weird finesse type work. I saw a uh, video. Wasn't there actually some hacksawing involved as well? Yes, a hacksaw <laughs> required for that. It required taking a rotary dial out of a vintage phone and modifying it and all sorts of stuff. I made a whole video. And meanwhile, the momentum was building. I was getting more and more emails about um, people wanting them. And I'm like, oh, wow, I should really just do yet another total redesign and, and make it um, like really make a really polished thing, like which is the ultimate and something I could maybe mass produce. It would still be a kit, but maybe I could mass produce it fully assembled eventually if I can figure out FCC licensing and things like that. So right. that's what I'm working on now. And I'm hoping to release it in a few months, actually. Yeah, it's exciting. It, I never thought that would happen. I mean, it was, it was bizarre. It was really bizarre. And that's part one. Stop by next week for our second group of top interviews from 2021. And don't forget to subscribe for more. Happy New Year and hack on.